Ladies and gentlemen, friends, colleagues, uh, my name is Adam Habib. I'm the Vice Chancellor of Wits University. So I want to welcome you uh, on this evening uh, to this lecture on South Africa in the world uh, by Minister Naledi Pando, Minister of uh, International Relations. Uh, I do want to, uh, I will say a few words about Minister in a couple of minutes, but I wanted to kick off by saying that you know, we, we speak too little, we deliberate too little about South Africa's place in the world. And, and uh, we do this at our peril because our ability to enable national freedom, our ability to create an inclusive society is in part dependent on the global order. It's in part dependent on how the global economy operates, on how other uh, countries operate. Uh, and I think that there's no more powerful an example of this than this moment of, moment of COVID-19. And you see in this moment of COVID-19, two uh, perturbing developments in the global order. The first is what I call a chauvinist nationalism. A nationalism that's not progressive, that not, doesn't see the nation as taking place as its place in, as part of a global community, but a nationalism that is solely focused on we against the other. And what can we get uh, that is different from the other? And the most potent example of this is the form of vaccine nationalism that has emerged in the global order. What you're seeing is rich countries very, very quickly purchasing potential vaccine stocks that could emerge so that in two or three or two months or three months, even if there is a vaccine, places like Africa, where marginalized communities uh, live and places in the developing world will be at the back of the queue. I want to remind you that when we had the, the flu challenge, the swine flu in 2009 and 2010, Africa received the vaccine after the, the, the flu had disappeared, after it had been wiped out. And I worry that this is just the most potent example of it. And so if we're really serious about our future as a nation, it's important that we take the globe understand the globe, etc. So that's the first thing I wanted to say. The second thing I wanted to say is, you know, as somebody who's reflected quite a bit on international relations, I do think that when we do focus on international relations, we focus too much on the descriptive events. We tell you what is happening without understanding how to change that order. And how to change that order depends on what leverage you are able to develop as a nation itself. And I don't mean leverage in the form of hard leverage, like nuclear weapons or military. You can also have soft leverage in the forms of alliances, in the size of your economy. And this is why a free trade agreement on the African continent is so important. Not only because it enables trade, but it enhances the negotiating power of the African continent in relation to other stakeholders in the global economy. And so we need to think about it in causal terms, how to enable outcomes that will be facilitative of inclusive, uh, an inclusive society. So when, for me, we just do too little deliberation on international relations, and when we do do it, we focus too much on the descriptive effects as opposed to the causal variables that can fundamentally shift outcomes in a manner that, that, that is in our favor. The final thing I want to say, and I think this is important, is that if we do not learn as a human community to build the bridges of human solidarity, if we get increasingly focused on an arena of national chauvinism or racial chauvinism or ethnic chauvinism or religious fundamentalism, we run the risk 
that we will not survive as a human species in the next 20 years. Because all of our challenges have become transnational in character, whether it's climate change, whether it's public health, and all of these challenges will not be resolved unless we can think as a global community of citizens. And so it's important that we start thinking through, all of us, about how we create and build the bridges of solidarity, human solidarity. I think that we can't have a better person to speak about this than Minister Naledi Pando. I know Naledi Pando for some time. She was Minister of the Department of Science and Technology and built an incredible, has left an incredible track record there. She was a Minister of Higher Education and at a different moment, a Minister of Education, including higher education and basic education. And she and I have had differences of opinion before, and I think she's uh, at the risk of uh, emboldening it. I do want to say the thing that I am confident of is, is the fact that Naledi Pandey will give us um, a kind of lecture that we need to hear, because she does take a portfolio seriously. And I know I've said this before, too many ministers don't understand the portfolios. The one thing I can tell you is Minister Pando has always understood her portfolio because she makes it her job to understand the portfolio. So I look forward to this lecture, Minister Pando. And I, I, I think if there is a moment where such a lecture is particularly important, it is this moment because effectively, the great moment of international relations was up to 2008. We brought conflicts down on the African continent by two thirds between 1994 and 2008. Between 2008, and I'm sorry to say 2018, was the last period for Durko. I'm hoping that we are on for a reset, simply because I know that you take your responsibility seriously. And I look forward not only to this lecture, but for you to doing a reset to Durko in the coming months and years. Thank you very, very much. And welcome to this lecture. Uh, thanks, uh, uh, thanks, Professor uh, 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 Habib, uh, for the very spirited uh, opening. Um, I, I just want to, to welcome participants. Uh, please uh, use the chat function for, uh, for raising your questions. Uh, we'll be monitoring it and we'll pick up on those questions. Uh, Minister Pando, uh, what, a, what a lovely, uh, wonderful pleasure to, to have you come to our school. We extremely delighted. We've been waiting for uh, for this evening. Uh, so uh, everyone is, is is looking forward to to hearing from you uh, to um, to sprinkle water to what has been uh, a very dry uh, uh, terrain of foreign policy uh, in South Africa. Over to you, Minister. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Program Director. Uh, allow me to uh, recognize uh, Vice Chancellor uh, Professor Adam Habib uh, and to thank him for his kind remarks. I'm not sure they're deserved, but uh, I thank him nevertheless. Uh, and of course, let me thank you, uh, Professor Kobo, for inviting me as head of school of the Viz uh, School of Governance uh, to speak this evening. I would like to greet uh, members of uh, the Viz University Council who may be present uh, uh, and uh, you know, uh, paying uh, any interest in this lecture, staff of the uh, School of Governance, I understand uh, uh, various of their excellencies, ambassadors and high commissioners, and members of the diplomatic corps at large who are uh, resident in South Africa have expressed interest in this uh, lecture and uh, I greet them. Uh, representatives of international organizations, government officials, and of course uh, the future of South Africa, the student body of WITS, uh, School of Governance, uh, and of course distinguished uh, ladies and gentlemen and all interested parties. I must express thanks uh, for the invitation to uh, deliver uh, uh, this talk uh, this evening on the theme, South Africa's place in the changing global order. Now, anyone uh, brave enough 
to talk about today and the changing global order is uh, engaging in somewhat of hazardous uh, duty because we are still in very uncertain territory uh, currently where all of us are attempting to uh, reshape and uh, uh, give concrete definition uh, to how we will pursue international cooperation and diplomatic relations uh, once we overcome uh, the current health emergency that all of us are confronted with. Much attention is being given to the future of global relations in a great deal of, uh, of literature and various uh, think tanks. And this has been evident uh, this year because of the pause that has been brought to the normal practice of uh, international relations by the emergency uh, uh, of the pandemic. This year is a notable year in international relations matters. It is the 75th anniversary of the establishment of the United Nations. And it has also been, strangely enough, a year in which uh, we have witnessed somewhat of a colossal struggle between the United States of America, the United Nations and various institutions of the UN, both for influence and for the shaping of global peace, security and development. Many observers of the geopolitical terrain agree that the present character of global affairs and the arrangement of the global order still results from increasingly volatile global processes that seek to reshape traditional norms of unipolarity. So much of what we will talk about comes about as a result of this battle to challenge this impetus of unipolarity, including, of course, the influence of the well-established swinging of the pendulum from the West to the East, and the reaction that this swing has prompted in what was the formerly uncontested unipolar power status of the United States of America. Well, while all of us in the world are still making sense of these emerging trends, the impact of the old order continues to persist, and this we must acknowledge. The Cold War, a period in which we saw the world divided into mainly two camps under the rubric of bipolarity between the United States of America and the former USSR, came to an abrupt end somewhat in 1991 with the implosion of the latter superpower. The coming about of the so-called unipolarity, and I don't think the characterization is that simple, but for purposes of our lecture, we have to, to state it in those terms so that we're able to have a deliberation. So the ensuing of the unipolarity was widely interpreted by many as the triumph of Western thought systems, Western institutions, Western models of governance represented by this superpower status of America. I think it is important to point out that Africa freshly emerging at that time from post-colonial recovery did not feature as a likely beneficiary of the then changing world affairs. So as this reordering was happening, there wasn't a theoretical or practical discussion as to how Africa might take its place in the emerging world order. Rather, Africa continued to be an afterthought to be exploited and abused. It follows, therefore, that any reference today to the changing global order implies a shift in this unipolar geopolitical landscape. So I'm arguing that the global ideological and political hegemony of the US 
is being relentlessly contested by non-Western antithetical forces with profound implications for the rest of the world. I'm not implying there is success, but I am arguing there is challenge, especially implications for the global South of which South Africa is part. At the same time, the other sense in which the changing global order can be understood is with reference to the demise of the post-war interstate system constructed from 1945, chiefly again under the political leadership of the United States, following the end of the Second World War. Citing the current US government's retreat from some of the key international treaties, protocols, and agreements, and the apparent aversion to the multilateral order, critiques of the Trump administration have begun to accuse America of unraveling this post-war international system. Ironically, it was the then international climate of increased unilateralism at that very point of the end of the Second World War, where we had ascendant populist ideologies, ultra right-wing nationalism, zero-sum politics, racist demagog demagogy, and religious intolerance, among other toxic variables, which having led to World War II, prompted the post-war victors to seek to entrench a multilateral order as the bedrock of a new international system. So then having shaped somewhat of this framework of a scenario of international organization, the exercise of reflecting on our place in this changing world order is I believe an urgent task for our government and from a Pan-African point of view, it is an imperative for the African continent under the stewardship of the African Union. I believe the kind of thought making we will have in this meeting should be a process of theoretical and practical reflection that African countries undertake in a very deliberate manner jointly in order to define our path and how we will ensure we achieve our core objectives. And of course, as we seek to do this, as we understand this framework that has shaped so much of our global relations, there are other factors to consider. Our world is currently in the midst of a debilitating global pandemic, which has disrupted the pre-existing business as usual paradigm. It has forced nations to rethink their strategies within these unfolding undefined conditions. The pandemic has somewhat starkly exposed weaknesses in public institutions worldwide, the inadequacy of social security support in poor communities, weak health systems, and a lack of digital capabilities in much of the world. We've been able, as South Africa, to continue a great deal of our daily business by virtual means. But for many parts of the world, such interface is absolutely absent. And with a lockdown, there is an absolute pause to national public activity. So the reality of the absence of digital frameworks in countries, in particular in the developing world and on our continent, is something we have to address. In the case of South Africa, the pandemic happened at a time when our country had begun to grapple with a number of socio-political challenges. These include the task of strengthening 
our public governance institutions, and of course, the honor and privilege of assuming the chairship of the African Union for the year 2020. While we were settled with the task of reimagining our country's place within the changing global socioeconomic condition, as well as addressing the continent-wide implications of the reconfiguration of global forces, South Africa had to suddenly, in a very changed circumstance, attempt to be a thought and practice leader in such a context. This pandemic severely affected the key objectives of South Africa's 2020 chairship of the African Union as our priorities and focus suddenly had to shift to mitigating the adverse effects of the pandemic on Africa. We had anticipated our focus would be our continental infrastructure program the implementation of the African Free Trade Area Agreement, silencing of the guns with a particular focus on Libya and other areas of conflict. But suddenly, the focus had to be leadership to address and mitigate the pandemic. South Africa and Africa's ability to successfully combat COVID-19 within fluid global processes has been framed by structurally weak and deteriorating socioeconomic conditions, which pose a threat to the ongoing political sovereignty of the continent, given national indebtedness to international financial institutions and lenders. The fragility of our economies suddenly became extremely apparent as this pandemic hit us. Despite us having attained independence in the post-war period, and thus having the opportunity to frame a new socioeconomic profile, we must admit that our continent has remained largely reliant on former colonizers and external funders. And where we had made progress, because we should recall that in the past decade, over 21 African countries began to achieve a strong base of financial independence and growth. All of this has been paused by the pandemic. South Africa, as a latecomer to political freedom on the continent, has, I believe, also allowed itself to be hostage to outdated economic practices while constitutionally embracing the most progressive socioeconomic rights and political values. Since 1994, Democratic South Africa has been a principled exponent of advancing the African agenda and contributing to the maintenance of global peace and security, as well as the building of a better world. Whatever the emphasis and variance on the theme from time to time, the integrity of this grounding framework has remained intact over more than two decades of democratic South Africa. <clears throat> I must also emphasize that South Africa's place in the changing global order is indivisible from its broader African context. So at the core, of our self-identity is the Pan-Africanist vision of unity, solidarity, and a common African destiny. Pan-Africanism is a vital facet of South Africa's notion of progressive internationalism, which entails opposition to the perpetuation of the legacy of global imperialism, colonialism, racism, the dominance of the global north over the south, as well as global structural inequality and poverty. Now, although world affairs remain in flux, we are aware from the current state of geopolitics that this pandemic 
is ossifying existing global animosities among several powerful nations, as well as exacerbating global inequality. So we absolutely need to rethink our place in the world in the context of the impact of this COVID-19 pandemic and how it has influenced the geopolitical reality. I have often said to uh, uh, colleagues on the continent that never again should any health emergency find us at the weak point that we were found when this pandemic entered our shores. And there's a great deal of work we must do to ensure that we are never in such a weak position. I think that COVID-19 adds a significant new dimension to international relations for all our countries. Many countries are facing major economic contraction which will affect every aspect of life and citizens' livelihoods and will invariably impact on their international relations as well as on international peace and security. Some seem to believe that the reversal of the impact of the pandemic will be easily secured. But imagine tourism for a moment as an important sector. And imagine the insecurity and fear that accompanies the notion of traveling outside your country. Imagine the number of people who have lost jobs from countries far wealthier than our own. How do we ease the re-entry to the tourism sector given these conditions? So we need, I think, to be guided very much as we execute our global relations by our national interests, which have indeed shaped our foreign policy. In broad brushstrokes, our national interest revolves on promoting the well-being, socioeconomic development and upliftment of our country's people and using our international relations to help us to do this. It relies on us protecting the planet for future generations and ensuring the prosperity of our country, but of our region and of the continent as well. This broad brush framework of South Africa's national interests underpins our foreign policy, a policy driven by us seeking to pursue the observance and practice of human rights, practice and promotion of development, practice of conflict resolution and settling all conflict by peaceful means, promotion of nuclear disarmament, responsiveness to climate change, and the championing of the agenda of the countries of the South. These are not popular objectives to appropriate as a foreign policy. And I get many phone calls as I did today, directing me to act in a different way from the aspirations I articulate here. In pursuit of these objectives, our country has sought to reposition itself as a consistent moral compass and a principal voice of reason in a changing world which is increasingly characterized by selfish and narrow interests. So we have a very strong imperative to build our economy. There are many countries with a great deal of sovereign funds that we could draw on to invest in South Africa. Some of these countries pursue these narrow interests I refer to. How do we establish our relationship with them while continuing to pursue the ideals that all South Africans hold so. We have found ourselves affected by our normative approach. 
which I believe is largely driven by our founding values and by the provisions enshrined in our constitution. The respect for human dignity, the achievement of equality, the advancement of human rights and freedoms, achievement and promotion of non-sexism and non-racism, and of course the supremacy of the constitution and maintenance of the rule of law and ensuring durable democracy. We also base our practices and relations on our history of overcoming apartheid and the manner in which that struggle was waged as a popular struggle of the people. And importantly, we do believe that our example of a relatively peaceful transition to democracy and our efforts at reconciliation can be used to good purpose in our global relations. It's these values that I believe have helped South Africa in being a consistent voice, as I explained to a fellow minister yesterday, in solidarity with the people of Palestine, the people of Sahrawi, and a voice for peace in Africa and peace in other parts of the world. We are often a lone voice, but it is an important lone voice that we must not allow to diminish. <clears throat> in sum, the changing character of the prevailing global order is shaped by destabilization of the post-war multilateral legacy by the intent to unilaterally impose the ideas of the United States and its notion of global leadership. The economic rise of China plays a central role in shaping the prevailing global order, as well as the increasing interest of India in the world outside it. And as we see the attempts by Russia to assert alternative global poles of power. And then of course, the impact of the pandemic on the interstate ecosystem. So these fluid global geopolitics are being impacted upon by dominant countries, economically powerful, some politically powerful, which are seen to be opting for foreign policies which undermine the stability of the interstate system as they drain, they, they face draining counterclaim to global influence from increasingly emerging powers. So there is, there is challenge out there. And what we need to do is identify those challenge countries and form collaborative partnerships so that the voice of progressive interests is a combined voice that begins to enjoy influence. I believe there are times at which we do achieve this collaboration, but it is entered into by very powerful force alternative voices. So perhaps for the first time since the end of the Second World War and the collapse of the so-called Eastern Bloc, our world is experiencing somewhat of a seismic shift in power or opportunity for seismic shift in power from a plausible idea of a multipolar world. A few years ago, international speeches would very, very rarely refer to the importance of multilateralism. Today, if your country speech does not refer to multilateralism, it is considered somewhat of a conservative speech and not attuned to progressive ideals. I think Africa should be concerned that as we discuss shifting global forces, our continent still remains on the margins 
seeming to observe rather than reshape. Our continent needs to use the current crisis to define a new, stronger relationship with the world based on African terms. There are, of course, other objective developments that are shaping the international scene. These include the increasingly digital world, the opportunities of the fourth industrial revolution, so-called, the impact of Brexit on the global economy, the rise of anti-immigrant nationalism in the EU zone and in the United States, and an increase in terrorism and extreme activities worldwide, including in parts of Africa, even Southern Africa at this time. Generally, that age of broad notions of easy definitions of biopolarity and unipolarity have given way to greater complexity. We have an absence of collective global leadership and real challenges to collective multilateralism. And with this, we have a need to develop a more sophisticated understanding of the world and of our country's position and aspirations in it. And we as South Africans need to talk much more about South Africa globally rather than just South Africa domestically or nationally, as we tend to, to do. Practice that might marginalize us from the important role we could play internationally. So I think we need to look at how global changes can assist us in shaping new opportunities and new objectives. In terms of the broader, broader global approach, our country continues to defend multilateralism. We continue to refer to the maintenance of a rules-based multilateral system. And we argue for the reform of global institutions of governance. So while uh, we insist that multilateralism is important, we're not saying the global order and its current makeup should stay as they are. South Africa also deploys its efforts to strengthen the G77 and play a role within it, as well as an unaligned movement among other multilateral institutions. And again, wherever we play a role, we do so with a broad continental inclusion as part of our agenda. We also are working hard to identify allies in the African continent and to build strategic alliances with countries on the continent in pursuit of our common objectives. Of great example, and I think to be well studied by academics and by the School of Governance, is the manner in which South Africa and the other African non-permanent members of the UN Security Council have been able to form a coherent unity that has been tested by various attempts, but that has held ground during our term as a non-permanent member of the Security Council. It's been a very important formation of unity. Our alliances on the continent begin with our links within the SADC region and then include various countries on the continent. We firmly believe that the integration of SADC is critical for our region's economic development and for South Africa's global competitiveness. So as South Africa, we've got to lead in getting SADC correct, focused on development, focused on our integration agenda, and executing all the plans 
and programs related to achieving that integration effectively. Beyond the SADC region, we've been able to advance the African Renaissance agenda, where we've built close relations and exchanges with countries such as Nigeria, Algeria, Ethiopia, and Senegal, which all of you would recall led to the drafting and then adoption of the new partnership for Africa's development. Yes, it does still live, and it is still an active driver of a number of initiatives that we support and oversee on the continent. This intra-African collaboration, NEPAD, constituted what could be referred to as anchor states on the continent states that are able and willing to bring their strength to bear on the achievement of set goals of a collective. While this began well, up to a point it is true that there is a great deal of room for improvement in effectively using this lead strategic cooperation and alliance to push the African agenda. Under the leadership of our president, we need to ensure that we continue to build on some of the early successes of NEPAD and bring it into play in a much more dynamic fashion than has been uh, the, the, the practice in the past few years. We need to use both the African Union and the NEPAD uh, formation to address matters of peace and security, economic integration of our regional bodies, and greater industrial uh, action. We are also aware that the world is not monolithic and that the normative aspects of our positioning might run counter to certain geographical, developmental, or economic partners, such as with respect, with regard to respect for human rights, and democratic values. All these nuances need to be taken into account when we finally decide our approach to particular issues. Notwithstanding the need to be guided by South Africa's identity and values in the international system. There does come a time within international relations where pragmatism and idealism need to be balanced on a case-by-case -case basis. In this regard, South Africa intends to continue to advocate for the strengthening of the key pillars of the African peace and security architecture, which is regarded as pivotal to Africa's endeavors to take collective responsibility and ownership of the continent's peace, security, and development agenda. This is the overarching framework for continental efforts to instill a culture of democracy, of good governance, of conflict resolution, and of preventive diplomacy across the entire peace continuum. This includes developing practice of mediation, of peacekeeping, of peace building and of effective post-conflict reconstruction and development. Our peace architecture serves as an enabling platform to accelerate efforts in this regard. We are pursuing our chairship of the African Union under the theme silencing the guns in Africa by 2020, we had intended and through this creating conducive conditions for Africa's development. This theme was endorsed by the 33rd Ordinary Session of the African Union in February this year. Despite the breaks that have been introduced by the pandemic, we are determined as South Africa to continue to utilize high-level multilateral and bilateral meetings and fora to promote and advance our objective and goal and that of Africa 
of building peace and security. Key among these objectives are the strengthening of our security and peace architecture is the implementation of the African Union Master Roadmap on silencing the guns, and our argument for adequate resourcing for AU-led, UN-mandated peace operations, and the promotion of higher levels of gender mainstreaming and responsiveness across the African Union and United Nations architecture. We remain as South Africa a proud member of the African Union and support all the objectives that it has set for us in the Constitutive, Constitutive Act. We believe that the principle of humanitarian intervention against war crimes, action against genocide and crimes against humanity remain important imperatives that we should pursue. As a country, we are very active in AU structures and processes. This includes our efforts to strengthen all mechanisms directed at securing peace and preventing conflict, as well as supporting reconstruction in countries such as South Sudan and working with colleagues in Libya to arrive at an agreed peace by all parties in Libya. We have used our membership of the UN Security Council, a non-permanent membership, to advocate for peaceful dispute resolution and inclusive dialogue worldwide. We've also promoted cooperation between the United Nations, the African Union, and our regional and sub-regional organizations. Continental unity is at the heart of our strategy. A divided Africa will not be a powerful Africa. This aspiration of African unity emphasizes that political unity in Africa will be the culmination of our integration process. This will include eventually the free movement of people and the establishment of agreed continental institutions which will result eventually in economic integration. As South Africa, we will always be part of collective African efforts aimed at realizing agreement on the form of continental government and institutions by our ambitions for 2030 and beyond. We also advocate for reform of global governance institutions, such as the United Nations and its technical bodies, which in our view do not represent the current global political, economic, and development configuration. We believe it's vital that the United Nations and especially the UNSC should be reformed. We will continue to call for text-based negotiations which will lead to the fundamental reform of the Security Council in order to ensure the representation of the continent as a permanent member. Although this matter is influenced by the common African position called the Ezzelini Consensus, we agree that we may need to relook at what we take into text-based negotiations, but we firmly hold the view that we cannot continue to discuss reform. We must begin to write reform, to negotiate reform. In the 10 years since we adopted the Ezzulini consensus, we've not really evaluated our performance in advancing the common African position. We believe the AU needs to lead this review urgently so that we identify additional actions which will advance our goals. We do know that there have been attempts to divide Africa in terms of its support 
for the reform we all agree that is really need. With regards to global economic governance, we believe Sub-Saharan Africa is underrepresented within the existing Bretton Woods institutions, and especially in the IMF, where 43 countries are represented by only two African chairs. We will persist with our call for an additional seat for Africa on the executive board of the IMF and continue to call for removal of veto power of some member states. We also promote participation in fora outside the UN family, as we believe this is a false multiplier for the legitimation of multilateralism. The BRICS nation, as an alternative multilateral platform, for South-South cooperation exemplify this belief at the center of our foreign policy. The BRICS nations themselves have largely shown unshaken confidence in and reinforced their support for a rules-based international system and for multilateralism. We believe that BRICS is an important forum for global political, economic, and financial partnership, and for promotion of a world that is more equitable, balanced, and shaped on the important pillars of multilateralism and international law. The members of BRICS share these values of global governance reform and oppose unilateralism, protectionism, and supporting regime change. We believe that the BRICS family represents a potentially powerful coalition of countries internationally that can be a strong voice against unip unipolarity and unilateralism. And it is for this reason that we continue to participate actively in all the pillars and sectors under BRICS. Our role in the BRICS formation continues to provide a key platform for the achievement of our national interests and domestic and foreign policy objectives, including the BRICS countries support for the AU's Agenda 2063. We have registered many achievements in the past decade of BRICS. The pandemic has posed a challenge for us and the BRICS parties have come together to act in concert against the pandemic and to provide support to each other in this difficult time. We're currently working on renewing the BRICS economic partnership strategy in order to ensure that we secure greater collaboration <clears throat> in various economic sectors. We are also securing greater cooperation of health, technology, and cybersecurity. We've also agreed that we must accelerate the establishment as BRICS of the BRICS Vaccine Research and Development Center which will be located in South Africa as per BRICS agreement of the 2018 summit. We've consistently located the African continent and the global South on the agenda of BRICS and endeavored to synchronize policies adopted in regional and international fora with those that we pursue in the BRICS formation such as our Agenda 2063 and the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. And of course, the BRICS has yielded institutions that add practical value to our developmental goals. These include the New Development Bank and its African Regional Center, together with the Contingent Reserve Arrangement within that institution. So the current global environment 
is dominated by the response to the COVID-19 pandemic. This has affected all facets of life, from the global economy to international trade and travel and the functioning of international relations. It has the potential to erode the gains of globalization. But we've all realized that the pandemic affects all of us equally, not some of us. And so it has been a strong statement in support of multilateralism. We've also seen that it has increased tensions in the world trading system. Changes in the world trading system have influenced debates within BRICS as well. But the core values that brought us together in the first place remain intact even in the midst of this health crisis. Well, let me move toward conclusion by saying we shaped our foreign policy principles and formulated them following the end of the apartheid regime. This is over 25 years ago. In a very different world, set in that post-World War framework. However, while the principles that were operational then still apply, the overall, overall positioning on a number of areas is being recalibrated to reflect new challenges and opportunities posed by a changing global landscape. To this end, we are mapping and seeking to formulate a clearer understanding of the evolving trends and how they should influence our foreign policy and our national interests. Of course, in the midst of that reshaping, we will continue to defend multilateralism against attempts to regress into nationalistic approaches. We understand as well that the global world is significantly more unpredictable than previously understood. And therefore, we will ensure we are able to adjust and adapt to emerging trends. We do believe the opportunity to reshape global relations has come with this crisis and that we must seek these new links and collaborations as we rethink our partnerships. We believe that the responses, particularly access to equipment, to new vaccines, new forms of treatment need to be executed with a strong commitment to human rights and with ensuring equitable access for all people throughout the world. We believe our recovery strategies of our economies must address the inequalities which were very apparent as the crisis hit. Our decisions will continue to be based in conclusion on the desire for a just, humane, and equitable world order in which all of us enjoy enhanced security, peace, dialogue, and we hope economic justice. This is the kind of environment we aspire the world to create as we shape our relationship with the international community. I thank you very much for your attention this evening. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Minister, for uh, a very comprehensive um, uh, public talk, uh, which touches on, on both uh, the ideals uh, of South Africa's foreign policy, as well as uh, marking out very clearly uh, those areas where pragmatic approaches uh, are, are necessary. Uh, uh, very clear points on how uh, the country sees its 
place uh, in the broad African continent uh, and, and the vision that it, it carries uh, for, uh, for continental institutions. Um, a very contextual uh, a speech uh, given the, uh, the, com the complex uh, environment that we find ourselves uh, in uh, with a COVID-19 uh, pandemic and, and, and very uh, uh, worrying uh, um, you know, uh, 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 markers as well uh, with respect to uh, the recession of multilateralism uh, under the weight of um, the rise of what uh, uh, Prof. Adam Habib referred to as um, uh, chauvinist nationalism. Um, the, you've also touched on, on some of the, of the new themes uh, that we, we will have to grapple with, uh, such as uh, the role of technology, uh, the, the, the increasing shift to, uh, to, towards digital economy um, uh, globally, uh, and, and how Africa still lacks in, in this area. And, 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 and I think you know, they, they, there's uh, something to think about there, uh, just to think about how we can use uh, this crisis as, as a spare uh, to undertake transformative change uh, in, in, um, uh, in a range of areas that you've highlighted. I just want to, uh, before I, um, I, I go to the questions and answer session, uh, just allow uh, uh, Prof. Habib um, to, to raise uh, some critical points uh, from, uh, from the presentation that, that you made. Um, mindful that uh, you, you have time uh, constraints. Thanks. Uh, uh, Prof, no, I think actually that there are already quite a bit of questions in the question and answer session. And I think rather than uh, take up more time from myself, it might be useful to, for you to just identify some of those questions so that the minister has an opportunity uh, to reflect on the kinds of questions posed by the community. Can I suggest that we go directly to the questions and answers that have been, that have been identified in the question and answer chat line. Thanks, uh, thanks, Prof. Uh, I am going to kick, kick off um, uh, just with uh, uh, two questions uh, from myself, uh, Minister. Uh, you've, uh, you know, you've, you've spoken about uh, how the unraveling of the liberal international system uh, that was led uh, by uh, by the U.S. post World War II uh, is unraveling, and and how uh, this poses new new threats um, in, in in the global uh, economic system, in the global system broadly. Um, is are we really experiencing the collapse of uh, liberal internationalism or, or multilateralism uh, on the one hand, or? Uh, just the failures of a, a country that was a hegemon for, for a long time, but, uh, but um, that, those value, that you know, those values may still very well be, be, be relevant. Um, and, and the second question is uh, regarding the sort of the, you know, the, the new um, developments in international relations, especially the the growing importance of science and technology. I, I thought that uh, uh, perhaps you, you could touch on, on some of those uh, areas, uh, the, you know, the, the risks posed by cybersecurity, as well as the opportunities uh, that lie uh, in, uh, sort of, you know, in your, the so-called fourth industrial revolution uh, technologies, uh, the AIs, industrial robotics, um, uh, and, and various other uh, digital platforms and tools uh, that are not yet mature in, in the African continent, and that can very well serve as um, as instruments to uh, you know to close um, socio-economic divides, uh, as well as to empower uh, uh, you know the the marginalised in in the continent to uh, to progress. At the end, we have um, a, a number of questions. Uh, one is, um, the, there was a question about, uh, about Zimbabwe. Uh, there is a feeling uh, among some that uh, you, you, you sidestepped uh, the, the question of Zimbabwe and, and how South Africa uh, is positioning itself uh, in relation to what's happening in Zimbabwe and, and whether there are uh, solutions in, in the offing. 
um, the, there's a question about uh, the role of youth uh, in, uh, in, in, in the current global order, uh, but you know, you, especially for in the context of, of the African continent, uh, uh, where, where youth is, uh, is you know, predominantly youthful continent and a continent that faces many of these ills uh, that, that you've spoken about. Um, uh, how do you see the, this uh, global order, um, how, you know, the, the positioning of the young people in, in this uh, current global order, uh, or some, some may refer to it as uh, a global disorder? And finally, uh, for this round, the, you've alluded to the BRICS as uh, an avenue for challenging uh, the hegemony of the West. And uh, there are two countries in the BRICS that have been uh, very awkward uh, and, and also um, uh, acted in, in a fashion that suggests that uh, they uh, are driven by val values that have nothing to do with um, uh, strengthening the global system, but, but their own interests. Um, you, you have Russia. Um, which is led by uh, a, a sort of, you know, the United Russia is, is, a, uh, is a right wing party. Uh, and I'm not sure how, you know, it, it makes the country progressive. And also the uh, Brazil currently is under a populist nationalist leader. Uh, and, and it would seem to me that um, uh, they, they are divergent, divergences of values within the, the BRICS. It's not clear what uh, normative ideals um, the BRICS countries cohere, uh, cohere around. So, yeah, so those are the questions uh, for now, Minister. O over to you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much uh, uh, for, for those questions. Um, I, I'd like to start with uh, the, the new threats, Professor Kobo, as you, you spoke uh, of them. Um, I, I don't think it's a collapse of the multilateral system, but I do think it is severely threatened. And I think uh, beyond us uh, speaking of its importance, which I, I believe it, it has, we need to have a unified voice as the global community and the broader membership of the United Nations, especially now, as we approach the UN General Assembly virtually, we should have a united voice of the General Assembly in support of the United Nations. I cannot imagine a world in which only nation states are able to respond to world challenges. I don't think uh, all countries in the world would be able to deploy peacekeepers to various parts of the world. You need an international institution of a multilateral character that would do that. So I do think that uh, we have at times been rather mild in our criticism of the attacks on the United Nations. Uh, I was horrified at uh, the manner in which the World Health Organization uh, uh, was, was being attacked. And I was very glad that South Africa defended the World Health Organization, both at the UN level, but also in a range of fora, including asserting its importance in supporting us in the regional response to the pandemic. And I applaud the South African leadership for having done that. So uh, I, I, I don't think uh, that we are failing. I do think that world leaders are being challenged to have the courage to hold up progressive ideals. And it is the citizens that are articulating support for more nationalist agendas. And we, we have to attend to that. And I think we've got to ask ourselves as the South African citizenry, how do we keep our own country internationally relevant and informed about the vital importance of international relations and global collaboration. Remember, we're talking about partnerships. We're talking about working together toward shared goals of development, toward building institutions that succeed in enhancing 
the lives of our peoples, toward ensuring that we have respect for human rights, that we practice democracy. So we're saying all of those things are ideals that our nations must share, not just by talking about them, but through the actual practice. This is what I believe global collaboration should seek to achieve. And any country that is opposed to that, we have to stand up against it. Because while it begins by acting against one power, eventually it would turn to all of us. And so it is vital that we join forces and form a robust collaboration that can assert the importance of multilateralism. So the failure of the US must be that it cannot cause us to turn our backs on multilateralism. And I believe there are enough countries uh, even to the point that we formed an alliance for multilateralism among foreign ministers, and we meet regularly on virtual platforms at the moment, but at the UN as well, and we uphold these ideals and seek to promote them in our different countries and in our interaction. On science and technology, uh, again, I've always believed we should be doing much more as the continent to enhance our research and innovation uh, capacity. Uh, I, I think we fail to invest in this at our peril. We should be building far stronger higher education institutions. We should be supporting our science councils. We should be developing areas in which we would be at the leading edge of innovation development. I even believe social innovation is important and we're not yet doing enough about it. So science and technology, absolutely uh, imperative. If we had been investing, as we've been arguing for many years, in centers of excellence on the African continent, we would be testing our own vaccines as Africa and not clubbing with the world with vaccines developed elsewhere. We need to realize that investing in science, technology, and innovation will make us determine our future on our own terms. That is how important science and technology On cybersecurity, I think we shouldn't rest on our laurels. We are trying to develop uh, an appropriate framework and, and policy. And as I see uh, the impact of um, social media, particularly false uh, information and how people absorb it, I, I think we need to, to look at the role that the cyberspace plays in all our lives. Uh, the fact that privacy is increasingly diminished. Uh, so, uh, and of course, the recent uh, theft, I understand, of all our private data. All of this is extremely uh, frightening, and we need to develop uh, mechanisms and strategies and the human capacity. We must train our young people so that they play a leading role in helping uh, uh, to both support development uh, in the cyber domain, but also ensure that we are able to protect ourselves. Well, on the fourth industrial uh, revolution, I mean, we've seen how digital can support development. And we need to make far greater use of this uh, than we're doing. I think the example of Rwanda uh, has been an interesting one, but also the use of digital uh, technologies in Kenya for purposes of access to public health systems. There are a range of opportunities, many of which can be managed by communities. Uh, but it means uh, we must make a spectrum available, we must have bandwidth, all of those uh, uh, should be made available and supported so that we do what actually former President Mbeki spoke of, which is that you can transcend your underdevelopment by accessing the most advanced tools 
And I, I think the digital opportunities are opportunities we, we, we need uh, to look at uh, to address some of the uh, development gaps that we have uh, in our country and, and on, the, on the continent. In fact, we would empower rural communities if they became the early beneficiaries of digital opportunities rather than leaving them behind. Uh, we've seen uh, with the advent of the pandemic, the use of online learning. I, I imagine, uh, I'm not a vice chancellor, I'm not clever enough for that, uh, but I imagine Professor uh, Habib or Professor Bilakazi are thinking about how do we use this digital opportunity for the long term? They're not gonna just ditch it because it's shown us something about what higher education can do to reach beyond the parameters that we reach at the moment. And I'm looking forward to seeing what's going to emerge from our higher education sector as they reflect on the experience of the digital learning that they had to put in place very speedily in, in this crisis. And again, I hope as they think of how they expand and utilize this development, that they'll think of that long term alongside deciding to close social divides. That would be a very interesting affirmation of what we learned in the past few months. Um, I saw sidestep Zimbabwe. Well, there was no country that I really referred to uh, in my talk. Uh, I'm fascinated uh, by the interests of South Africans always to pull us uh, uh, to, to Zimbabwe. It is an important issue, but it is not the sole issue. Why don't we talk about Lesotho and what President Ramaphosa has achieved there and how important it is to maintain peace in Lesotho? Why don't we talk about achieving democracy in Eswatini? Zimbabwe is important. We continue to engage Zimbabwe and we will do so until we help come out of the problems, crisis, challenges, whatever rubric they wish to use, until we achieve an outcome, which is necessary because it is clear that that great country is not where it should be at present, and anyone who wants to pretend might do so. But we will be close because we are comrades and friends. We are neighbors. We are there, I've said before, we stand ready to play a role. And once it's agreed that, hey, South Africa, come on, we need to work together. That minute, South Africa will be ready. Of course, there's a role, I mean, South Africa with respect to any country in the neighbor, in the neighboring uh, states and indeed in SADC. It's uh, absolutely clear that we would always play a role, even I believe on the continent, we still hold a, a very important place and must continue uh, to appreciate that. Of course, uh, I didn't mention uh, the youth, maybe because I'm so old as they always tell me, uh, but I believe the youth is the future. And we need, of course, to uh, engage young people, more particularly engage them to be progressive. Engage them to want, to desire, to work for democracy, to appreciate human dignity, to embrace the equality of women. Because then, when they are in power, when they run institutions, the basis of their work will be these positive ideals. I believe young people should be in educational establishments that educate them on many of the concepts I've referred to, which are used by people of my age and not sufficiently by the younger generation, because we don't think it's important to talk about these concepts, to actually explore what, what do we mean? Why is multilateralism important? Why should we have such a body? 
how should the world collaborate and so on. So absolutely, I think young people have an absolutely important role, uh, both uh, in the international sphere and many are extremely active, very impressive young people I have met in the African Union. And I know many young Africans are playing a very important role in the development of digital technologies, digital-based uh, on enterprises, and are doing a, a great deal to advance research on our continent. They really have an ambition uh, and uh, an energy uh, that our continent sorely desires. Many do embrace extremely progressive values in their practices. A lot of the green companies that have been created in South Africa in the last five years have been created by young people. This means they understand sustainability better than we do. So I, I'm, even if I don't mention them in my speech, it doesn't in any way mean a lack of appreciation. They're critical to our continent. Well, in BRICS, we don't uh, uh, devote time to say, right, South Africa, let's look at what's happening in your domestic situation. Why do you have members of ANC that are doing corrupt things? Uh, they've never asked us that, nor would we ask them. Why is, uh, I don't know, pussy whatever, not being uh, supported? Or why are the members arrested? We, we don't uh, really devote time to the domestic setting, but we do discuss our national challenges. Uh, and look at how we can use our partnership to overcome uh, some of our national challenges. And I believe uh, that by seeing our practices through the sharing that we have and through the chairship that rotates among the members, you begin to get a sense of that I may need to rethink my practices because you are exposed in the BRICS family. And so, uh, you know, when we discuss uh, uh, global affairs, when we discuss our posture internationally, and when we discuss development imperatives, to some degree we are talking about the domestic, but we talk about it at a very, very uh, uh, different level of a collaborative uh, structure. We're not there to teach each other lessons. That's not the BRICS. Uh, relationship. I think you would, we would learn from each other. As I was indicating uh, to my colleague uh, from India, the work that India has done on traditional medicine is absolutely fascinating in terms of social innovation. And I'm saying we have indigenous knowledge in South Africa, but we've not developed to the level of a significant national economic sector as India has done. And we have lessons to draw on on social innovation. So uh, we work very much in terms of uh, a broad set of ideals and not as a uh, sort of club where uh, we are there to snap each other uh, on the knuckles and uh, direct how uh, countries must run their domestic affairs. Uh, we hope, of course, that everybody will be like us. They'll have elections every five years. They'll have 100 parties in parliament. They'll shout at each other in parliament. You know, we've got a robust democracy. We hope everybody would be like that and have peace as well. And that will reduce uh, uh, poverty as Brazil did in its initial democratic phase. Um, but it would be from learning from each other rather than saying, hey, you know, you are not doing what we think and what we do is the right thing. I, I don't think that would make for a good, uh, a good partnership. I think I've, I've tried to address uh, uh, the, the few questions that you had posed. Thanks, Minister. You have indeed addressed the questions. We're not going to take up uh, any more of your time. We see we've reached uh, the end of uh, the discussion. What I'll ask my team to do is to collate the questions uh, and, and send them to your office. You don't have to reply to them because we can't send them to participants, but 
I think they will come up in, in other um, uh, lectures that, that you give. Um, and uh, at, at this stage, um, I'm going to ask uh, you, Minister, to make um, uh, final uh, observations and uh, kind of forward looking since we are in a pandemic um, period. How do we come out of this and, and how do we use uh, this as a spare, as a catalyst for transformative change uh, in South Africa as well as, uh, as, as in, the, in the continent? Um, and, and then I'll ask. Uh, 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 Prof. Habib, uh, to to please thank our 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 participants uh, uh, and uh, to do a vote of thanks. I hope you don't mind, Prof. No, that's fine. Thank you. Well, thank you very much again, uh, Professor Krobo, for the opportunity, and thank you to the participants who who listened in. I sincerely appreciate uh, that participants uh, did stay the course. Um, it's often a turgid uh, a subject. Uh, uh, international uh, uh, relations, uh, but there's a great deal of interest uh, in what we all do uh, internationally. I have made reference uh, to some of the lessons that I believe uh, emerge from this uh, health emergency, as, as I call it. The first is we cannot continue to have fragile public institutions, particularly in the health, but I'm, I think all other sectors. The second is, I believe Africa must do much more on research and innovation. Uh, and of course, that links to supporting higher education because higher education is the key vehicle for, for research. The third is, I believe more should be done on supporting fragile economic activities such as women working in so-called informal sectors throughout the African continent. The biggest burden of the impact on the economy of the pandemic and the lockdowns that were attendant to it has been on women, especially those mothers who on a daily basis put up their table on the street pavement just to earn enough for their children to have a meal. We need to find a way of bringing those women into the formal economy and ensuring that we provide them with the financial resources and the infrastructure support so that those businesses become real earners of a livelihood and become the basis for the fundamental restructuring of the economies on our continent. Can't neglect that effect that women experience, nor can they be treated as a side part of what the economic change uh, uh, needs to do. The fourth, we must train more health professionals. If we didn't have the doctors and nurses that we have in South Africa, I can't imagine where we would be uh, today. So we've got to look at nursing, especially, especially professional nursing, and ensure that uh, we really up the numbers, because I don't think any country can suffer an adverse consequence by having more trained professionals. Human capital is an important strength of Africa, and its support and development to a professional level is critical for our country. And then last lesson, multilateralism and international collaboration matter. If President Ramaphosa hadn't convened all those African meetings, if he had not appointed special envoys on the debt standstill issues and post-COVID economic recovery, the African side of the pandemic story would not have been heard. So international collaboration, very, very vital. I could go on and on, but let me stop at that point. Thank you very much again, Professor Kobo. Thanks, Minister. Um, wonderful, wonderful uh, presentation. Really appreciate it. Um, the, now we're going to uh, uh, Prof Habib to give a vote of thanks and we'll close the set. 
So colleagues, uh, Colbert, thank you very, very much. Uh, I did say at the beginning that uh, the minister would be somebody who would uh, demonstrate a, a true handle of the portfolio. And I think that her lecture and the way she's responded to the issues uh, has been really, really useful. There's not many, many ministers of foreign policy or international relations, Minister Pando, who speak about the importance of research in science and technology. Not many underscore the importance of women and uh, the importance of human capital. And, and I think that that's an important message and thank you for that. Uh, in addition to that, I think the articulation of the importance of multilateralism in an era of national chauvinism is particularly important. We cannot build, if you like, the bridges of human solidarity without the multilateralism that you've uh, articulated so powerfully, both in your lecture and in your final uh, summary. I do want to just leave with you a couple of things that I think are important because you could see there's an enormous amount of questions in the question and answer chat line. There was, and I leave it with you, you don't have to answer it. Uh, other than Zimbabwe, there was the question of Mozambique. And clearly a number of people are concerned about developments in Mozambique. Uh, there was, if you like, uh, an interesting question by Professor Ashili Mbembe about uh, the free trade arrangement and the free trade pact and what impact the free trade pact will have on the migration regime uh, for South Africa. And I think that that's an important question uh, and a challenging one, both for South Africa and many others. Uh, I must say, if for me to come back, I would say one other question. The thing, I really do believe that South Africa's great high point in international relations was the Mbeki administration. And at the heart of foreign policy in the Mbeki administration is a, is a perspective that I call realism from the South. How do you engage the global institutions and the global order with a view to subverting it from within by using levers? And the rationale at the core of that strategic plan was an alliance, a strategic alliance between Nigeria and South Africa. And it seems to me that if Africa is to play that role, the question of such a strategic alliance has to be back, at least pondered upon and deliberated. And I leave that with you for your consideration, of course. I do want to thank many people. I want to thank you, Minister, for the address, for taking the, the reflection seriously. And as I said, we leave you with others, and I'm sure there'll be many, many more of these conversations. I want to thank uh, um, much of the audience who've actually come and participated exactly that they have in the chat line and in the question and answer line. I want to thank the school, Professor Kobo and others who've actually played an important role in putting this together and his team in organizing this virtual format. And I do want to end by saying Minister, what I started off with, I think we have too few conversations on international relations in South Africa and the world. We've become too focused, uh, insular as a nation. And our freedom and our inclusion and our ambitions are not possible without understanding our role in the world and how we can, we can build on that. And so I, I, I wish, Professor Kobo, that we do many more of these and we bring to the four many more of these conversations. And with that, I want to thank all of you. And again, Professor Pando for the, for the wonderful lecture that you have given us. Thank you very, very much. We've come to the end of the proceedings. Um, uh, thank you, Minister. Thank you very much and good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you.